I am going to guess it's probably been since sometime last year. I don't think, and here we are in June already, that we have seen State Representative Stephen Harkin in studio with us since uh, maybe maybe once somewhere in there. Uh, it was uh, last year, I think. Been a while. Before the session. So I got an idea. I was kicking this around with Benito this morning, and I said what we need to start doing is even when, because in summertime, um, things are still busy in Boise. People don't realize committee work goes on. There's discussions. A lot of stuff going on. And what we should start doing is having a regular rotation where we bring in local members of the delegation on a sure. regular basis. And then even during session, you have to do it by telephone because obviously right. you're, you're, you're being called to the floor at various times. Uh, so we're going to have to start doing that and likely see, well, first of all, see more of you because uh, I, I'll point out, uh, I live in your district. Oh. And uh, in all fact, right. uh, well, a good part of our listening audience probably does. Uh, but we were we were talking and I got thinking about this. It's been almost two months because I remember it was Good Friday. We sat down and we were having a cup of coffee. And we got to talking about... Yeah, it was right after the session was over. Just after the governor's veto of the grocery yeah. tax repeal. Yeah. And at the time, it hadn't officially happened, but there was some discussion from some of your colleagues about filing the lawsuit. And then it happened. And I think, what, there's six from the Senate, 24 from the House? Yeah. So there's 30... And, and they're Republicans. Right. And so they're, they're they're on your side of the aisle. But you were telling me at the time that there's an alternative to all of this. And the alternative is simply patience. Looking to next year, right? Right. And then if the lawsuit fails, you still have that recourse. I think that's correct. Uh, if the lawsuit fails, the bill will uh, probably come back in the next session early enough so that if there is a veto, then there be then an override vote could be taken. And there were enough uh, votes in both the House and the Senate to override the veto by two or three on either side. So presumably uh, those votes haven't changed. The people are the same. Uh, so if the bill were to come forward and to pass in the same way and were to be vetoed, there would be enough votes to override it. And the case, I think, is heard on the 15th, or at least that's when we we say heard, but it may last a few days, arguments and the like. Uh, I don't know how that exactly works. I but. think it'll be a, a, a morning, just a one-day oral hearing before the court, and then uh, they'll take it under advisement and uh, issue a ruling, probably within a relatively short period of time, a month or two. Well, then again, if they say no, and, and it, the governor's veto stands, it could be August by that time, then we're only a few months away from the beginning of the next session. That's correct. And, I think this is the point a lot of people are asking is then why even bother to go through? You may ask that of your colleagues. Uh, it's got to be expensive to run a. Well, and there was a there was a phase in period anyway in the bill. It was not going to be effective until uh, 2018 mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, so those of us who thought, well, we could get this passed and uh, there would be an automatic quick 6% uh, reduction in, in tax on groceries, uh, that probably wasn't going to happen anyway. So it's going to be out there a ways. Uh, and the other, the other factor is that all of the candidates that have declared for governor on the Republican ticket, all four of them have indicated that they uh, would allow the, the tax to be cut, that they would not veto a bill that, uh, of this one. Lieutenant Governor Brad Little says that, so do the other three. Uh, so it, it seems to be ahead of steam for it. Uh, if I could back up just a second, basically... There's been quite an effort over the last several years to try to reduce substantially Idaho's tax structure. And I've been involved in that mostly behind the scenes. I sit on the tax committee. Mm -hmm. So I see most of the bills that are proposed. And the chairman of the committee basically tries to determine, based on the numbers of what the votes are, as to which discussions to have. This particular bill originated as an income tax reduction bill. Uh, and that would have reduced uh, income taxes on all levels of uh, people's income. That went over to the Senate, and the Senate basically took that away and substituted the grocery tax language that reduced that. Well, it came back over to the House and passed and then went to the governor, uh, and that's where it was vetoed. So there's a substantial number of people in the legislature who feel we should reduce taxes substantially. Uh, but the, getting the right mechanism to do that, whether it's grocery or income or sales or some combination, there's a lot of there's quite a bit of disagreement as to what the, what the best approach is. I was not surprised when 
Democrats actually supported this repeal of this grocery tax too, as well as I understand it, most of them. But they did not want to join the lawsuit as well. It was almost as if they thought we could wait this out. So interestingly enough, once in a great while, there's some agreement across the party lines. Well, the Democrats actually opposed the income tax reduction when the first version of the bill came out of the House. Mm -hmm. They all voted. They didn't want to see income tax reduction on people's income, which I thought was a bizarre position, but that's the position they took. Well, when the bill came back over from the Senate, having been changed, then they sort of uh, said, well, yeah, we'll, we'll go along. But they have not taken a lead here at all. They've essentially sat back and let the uh, the Republicans uh, kind of handle the, the matter. And if you look at the numbers, that's probably a good strategy. The Republicans dominate the legislature in terms of numbers and on the committees and so forth. So the, the Democrats would have a role to play, but they wouldn't have a decisive role. A lot of people were critical of the governor after the veto, but every time I've seen uh, Governor Otter take a, a, a big step like this, and I understand he was opposed to some of the gas tax issues over the years, I think that the argument, the key argument that I've always heard come out of him, and I've, I've gone to hear him speak at some of these town hall events, is that not opposed necessarily to cutting taxes, but his concern is if you don't cut spending commensurate, then, in other words, what are you going to replace it with? You've got two choices. You have, you have to cut the budget or you've got to find something else to tax. And and I guess he's looking for answers from people there, and I don't think he feels he's always getting them. I think the governor feels that uh, as the state is growing quite well, the economy is improving, uh, revenue is increasing at the state level, rather than uh, cut those uh, back in the form of taxes, uh, that we should fund the necessary services that government needs education, transportation, infrastructure, uh, prisons, water resources. We, the state took quite a hit during the recession. We were, we were down about a third of state revenue disappeared in an 18-month period from 2009 to about 2011. And we've gradually worked our way back to where that was. But uh, some areas are still cons considerably below the 2009 level. And I think the governor feels that we need to, you know, that we need to fund government adequately, not excessively, but adequately. And he feels, I think, that a sharp cut like this would uh, would make that difficult to do. He also feels that, say, that grocery tax, because it's something that everybody pays, it therefore allows the state to have people all participate in the taxing structure that nobody should get a free ride, that everybody ought to have some skin in the game in terms of, uh, you know, their their support for the necessary services of government. Grocery I, prices have dropped, by the way, over the last 30 years, so the tax itself, if you were paying twice as much for groceries, the tax itself might be more of a burden, but it's a little bit like the president's proposal for two cents a gallon on gasoline. The price is relatively low and stable at the moment, it doesn't hurt so much as it might in another time period. That's that's right. And so you have to kind of balance that. And I think the governor feels that this was not the time to make that kind of a cut. Uh, my own view is that we could have we could make that amount up pretty much on the basis of the growth. Okay, if you take away the tax cut, which is about 180 million, and you also take away the rebates that were involved, which is about 100 million. You were net left with a net loss of about eighty million dollars. Well, the state's revenue is growing by a hundred and fifty, two hundred million dollars every year for the last three, four, five years. The natural growth that's occurring in the state, the growth of the economy, people paying more in taxes in terms of income and purchasing more and gasoline, all those factors basically allow the state. We're on a basic upward upward path pretty well. And so I didn't see that as a real problem. And the people who were on the Revenue and Tax Committee kind of agree with that, that the general trend is pretty well. And, you know, you could always get to the point, if you were short, you could hold back and do some holdbacks in order to balance that annual budget as we uh, do every year. So I didn't see the problem in the same way that the governor does. Uh, but I do think his, his, that's the reason for his reluctance to, uh, to let this go forward. I want to mention uh, State Representative Stephen Harkin in studio with us. It's 916, and we've got 66. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310. 
KLIX and NewsRadio 1310.com. And if you've got a question or comment, remember the telephone number, 736-0300, 736-0300. We'll have more taxpayers as well, according to these population protect, uh, projections. It looks like that boom is just going to continue on for the next decade. It does. Uh, we've had very good growth in the state of Idaho in population and it's a kind of a key underlying number. If you've got good population growth, 2 3% a year, maybe not even that, maybe one and a half, you're going to do have a growing economy. There are a lot of places around the United States that would kill to have a 2% growth rate per year. And you and I have both seen those in we our careers. We grew up in those places. <laughs> we, we've both seen those in our careers of places that are, uh, frankly, you know, just kind of dying in, in a way economically. The western states, and particularly Twin Falls, is doing very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so there's a a general sense that the economy, as it expands, there are more people participating. People pay taxes in the form of sales and and purchases and income, gasoline and so forth. So it's not inappropriate to ask folks to participate in that. And I think that's the governor's position. I personally felt that we should approve this tax. It was the only significant... Uh, tax reduction we were going to deal with this last session. And I voted uh, for it in committee, and I voted for it on the floor, and I felt it should have been approved. And I I didn't communicate directly with the governor, but I did mention to a couple of his staff where I was on it. So I I feel he should have let it go forward. When when we do have this additional population growth, well, we'll take a telephone call before we get to the break first. Okay. Is there a headset there? You can grab that and... uh... So we can hear our caller here in just a moment. Okay. Uh, caller, we've got about a minute before the break. You can get your question out. We may have to get to it after the break, though. But go ahead. You're on the air with Representative Harkin. I agree firmly with what you're saying. I appreciate your article paper yesterday. You're right on. Regardless of what the Democrats believe, I believe in you. And you Representative, you. thank you. Uh, apparently you had something published that uh, backs this up. Uh, I do have some information to, to back that uh, up with respect to the uh, the top population growth in the tax structure. Basically, the state has been growing at about 5 to 7% per year for the last six or seven years. Double the national average, at least. And well over the national average. For all the surveys that come out show Idaho is one of the top four or five states in terms of job growth and employment and number of people working and so forth. So you can look around the Magic Valley and you can see the economy, it's cooking. Uh, so there's, there's no problem with the growth. If we were dead in the water or declining, as some places are across the country, yeah, that would be a different issue. But here we're growing pretty nicely. We've got a short break coming up. We've got more with a representative on the way in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we're at 64, temperature kind of ping-ponging around a bit, but on our way into the mid-90s potentially today. 20 minutes after 9 o'clock, Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Joining us in studio this morning, State Representative Steve Harkin, and he's uh, spending a few more minutes with us. Uh, as well as you have a comment or question, feel free to give us a call at 736 0300. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Coming up on 922, we're at 66. I've got to adjust my trifocals here in order to read that. Uh, you, by the way, don't have those. Uh, you've got better eyesight, apparently, than I do. Yeah. Well, I had, I had them worked on a little bit. <laughs> no, okay, I might have to do that. Uh, you're familiar with Chuck Malloy, being that you were in the newspaper business for sure, a long time. Sure, I've known Chuck a long time. He's a, he's a really well-known columnist in Idaho. And uh, he is writing today about the four men in the Republican Party who are all running for governor. And despite what people will tell you, there aren't that many big differences, I think, in how they would govern. They're all, uh, they don't believe in a lot of high regulation and they lower taxes, and they're all fairly conservative individuals. But you've known Lieutenant Governor Brad a little for a long time, and Chuck's theory is that he may in the long run have the best shot at this because he's, what, now sixth generation, I think, Idaho, with well, with counting his children and grandchildren as they're coming along. Right. And that that may make the the difference in a very close election with four people. Do you do you tend to agree with that? Well, I think he has uh, some significant advantages, and I should say right up front that I do support Brad Little at this point in the election. Uh, I came out for him uh, when he was uh, first announced, 
and I think he's a very qualified individual. He's a very he's, he understands state government. He understands the necessities of economic development, education, transportation. He's well versed in agricultural issues. Uh, the governor has uh, given him a lot of leeway to sort of represent the state in various ways. And uh, I'll make a prediction here that uh, he will be governor before the primary, that the governor Otter will step down uh, either into retirement or into a Trump administration position of some sort, and Brad Little will become the governor, and then we'll have an opportunity to sort of prove himself uh, to the people of the state and will be probably the leading candidate in the primary and I would think would win the primary. There's a difference of opinion among Republicans themselves over how much government should be involved with infrastructure. Now, your colleague Megan Blanksma and I were talking at the county fair last year, and she said that we've got to start treating Internet as a, as a public utility. Some Republicans, on the other hand, are a little nervous about getting government involved in promoting that. But uh, in, in the case of Brad Little, he was very concerned when he was here at a community meeting in Hanson a few months ago about the report that we were 50th in internet service. And I ended up sending his office a link about how that might be promoted even without a lot of government expense. It, it seems to be that, and, and I'm one of those too, I believe we need good roads for commerce, but I think that they're right when they talk about the internet, that if you have better internet, it's going to improve business. Well, traditionally, uh, the government has gotten involved in utilities when there is a monopoly, like electricity or sewer and water. You don't want thousands of sewer pipes running down the streets sure. of town. So you basically designate one one entity as the carrier uh, in the case of, say, telephone or electricity uh, or gas, and then that becomes a quasi-regulated industry. Uh, that's not occurred in the Internet sector because of, one, the competition nationally. There are a lot of companies out there vying for your Internet uh, dollar uh, whether it's uh, on the you know on the desktop or in the smartphone or whatever it may be, so I'm not sure how that would exactly work, but I think it's a good thought that we need to improve the accessibility to the internet and particularly in rural areas that uh, Representative Blanksman is talking about. We have another caller with us, and uh, we want to mention it's 9:25, almost 9:26. And caller, you're up next. You're on KLIX. Definitely, please improve the internet. <laughs> That's a well said, I guess. Uh, somebody says we definitely need to improve the Internet. So there are people out there. We had actually a personal discussion about this a couple of months ago, too, because I was having issues with one of my providers, and you told me about one that you've had for years, and it's you've never had a problem with Cable I've, One. I've had it for years. I've never had a problem. Uh, you know, I, it's, a, it's a mixed service. I get both TV and uh, Internet service, but I've never had any trouble with it at all. Where the difference is, though, where someone like Megan lives out in uh, the Emmett area, yeah. and, and so does the lieutenant governor, they don't necessarily have that quality of service in the rural areas. Well, the problem is, you know, it's, it's cost and distance. If you're out in a, in a rural area, you know, putting uh, cell phone towers and Internet service in rural communities, kind of like REA was in the 1930s and 40s and mm -hmm. 50s, and that was taken on essentially as a federal project to essentially electrify the United States. Prior to that, it was only in towns that you could get electricity. Uh, many farms were kerosene lanterns until well into the 1940s. We have another caller with us, and I do want to mention that number seven three six zero three hundred. And caller, you're up next. You're on the air with Representative Hartkin. Go ahead. Good morning. My second thought is leave the sales tax on the food. We're already used to paying that. If you take away the sales tax on food, then we're not going to get our roads improved and do the other things because people, again, won't want to pay the taxes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I th I've heard that There's argument from more than a few people. Yeah. Uh, I think that's illustrative of a point that, you know, many citizens understand the tax structure in Idaho quite well. I mean, here's an individual who called in and put his finger exactly on a particular issue involving sales tax exemptions. Now, you can debate whether this one or that one should be changed mm -hmm. or adapted. But the fact is that many people understand the nature of the tax structure and have concerns about how, it's, how, it, how it works in practice. That's a good observation. And, and, and he's not, as I say, I've heard this, you know, this audience is probably, they have a reputation as being 
conservative to libertarian, but I've heard that argument made by a great many of them. We have another caller with us. We've got about a minute before we go to the break. And caller, you're up next on Top Story. I do not see any of the taxes going for the roads in Idaho. Thank you. Well, that's a point that I think people are concerned about, too, is that we've had this fight going on for years, and we're still not to the point. We, we need a quarter billion dollars. We're still not there. Well, I, you know, two years ago, we increased uh, the gasoline tax by five cents, uh, the state side of it. And uh, most people, of course, didn't really notice that because the taxes, you know, the price of gasoline fluctuates enough. And since it's paid right at the pump, people see it more as a user fee than as a tax directly. But actually, the tax on gasoline is quite high relative to, let's say, the tax on anything else you would buy. The federal tax is 18 cents, and the state tax is now 32 cents. So on a basis of, uh, let's say, $2.50 a gallon, you're paying a substantially over 15% of the gas, of the price of that gas is in the tax. Well, if you had to pay 15% on a Coke or something like that or a, or a bag of zucchinis or oranges, you'd, you'd squawk. But because it is at the, at the pump and it's built in, uh, many people sort of accept that as the price of a user fee. We're going to have more coming up with the state representative in just a couple of minutes. We've got a short break at 9.30. We're at 68 already. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Our studio guest is State Representative Stephen Hartkin. And by the way, um, I have some coworkers who pronounce it like the basketball player, uh, and so they don't say Stephen, but Stephen is likely correct. Correct. Um, I, I just I think sometimes the younger folks get into these modern pronunciations, and uh, so I've heard you, you your name. People think you're playing for the the, the Warriors. Uh, but it's not true. Not yet, anyway. Not yet. I, don't, <laughs> I think they're doing plenty fine without me. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Curry is a pretty good ball player, we should point out, too, as well. 934. And uh, telephone number to reach our program today, 736-0300. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310. KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We have another caller, and uh, we'll go back to the telephones. Caller, you're up next. You're on the air with Representative Hartkin. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, I, I was out of the room for a little bit, so you may have discussed this already. <clears throat> but I was wondering, since uh, our grocery t- sales tax is being refunded either by way of a tax credit or a check, why do we have a tax, a grocery sales tax? seems to me like it costs money to send out all these checks. And so I just wondered if this problem has been addressed. Uh, that's, again, again, here we have a citizen who puts uh, her finger on a very important point, mm-hmm. and that is that the refunds from the tax, uh, from the sales tax on groceries, comes back. It doesn't come back in the form of a check. It comes back as a refund on your uh, on your income tax uh, side. So it's about a hundred dollars or so, right? It's about a hundred dollars, uh, and the uh, and the so, but that doesn't make up for the amount that most people spend. Most people will spend considerably more than that in the course of a year, uh, and this is a one-time credit, and it has to be applied for on the income tax. So if you're not filing an income tax return, you don't see that credit directly. And actually, that's one of the illogical points about it. At the time when it was put in place, many legislators felt that taxing food it was something that probably shouldn't be done. But they didn't want to give up the revenue, so they created this refund mechanism through the income tax side. And so the, the net loss is about 78 or or $80 million annually to the state. And as I said, I think that could be made up pretty easily from the growth. And I've talked with people on the finance committee, and they're in agreement with that, that the state is growing adequately, that we could handle that. I know that, uh, I want to thank her for the call. Russ Fulcher actually explained that he was one of the people behind that refund uh, that people are getting. But when I walk into, let's say, Winco, and I see Roma tomatoes for 79 cents, and I sometimes see green peppers for as little as 48 cents a piece. Right. Um, we're getting away with dirt cheap groceries, so the tax really hasn't hit me like I like what I would have paid for groceries in other states where they were tax-free. Well, and there's some discussion as to what it ought to include. For example, much a good share of the money comes from uh, 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 
carbonated beverages, Coke products Mm -hmm. and sodas, about 15% of the total revenue comes from just that one category. Well, there are some who say that we should leave that tax in place as an encouragement to have people not drink as much carbonated beverages. We all know that those are probably not as healthy as they as they could be. Uh, but others feel that that's just an, another intrusion of government into people's lives, a more nanny state, and we just ought to repeal the whole thing. When I lived in New York, uh, I remember they were raising the price of the alcohol tax every year because, well, they figured the sin taxes are easy to collect. Uh, but I talked to a fellow who distributed Molson beer, and I remember him telling me at the time that the markup was so high on beer, they would just lower the price and absorb the tax. And that's frequently being done by people, too, on the other side. Well, uh, people say here, you know, that during the recession, when we lost about $800 million of revenue over 18 months, the only category that continued to rise due the, during the entire recession was the alcohol category. People would, you know, they'd cut back on something else, but they weren't going to cut back on beer and uh, alcohol. So. <laughs> I had a friend who actually drove a truck for a beer company in uh, a distributorship, and he made that comment that recessions never hurt his business. I, th- I think that's probably true all over, you know. I'd like to raise another point, and that is that the perspectives on these things uh, uh, are quite broad. There are legislators who feel that we should take a particular set of actions and and uh, and uh, on various matters. There are others who feel, and I guess uh, this is more prominent on the tax committee, that we ought to work closely with the taxing entity, that is the state tax commission, to be sure that there's enough revenue to fund the services that we all appreciate, whether that's roads or corrections or education funding. You know, we're already committed across the state to major increases in teacher salaries over the next two or three, four years. Mm -hmm. We've Mm -hmm. already had three, four of those increased payments. Well, we're committed to that. We're not going to take that back. We've we've made that commitment, and we think that that's an important investment in the future education of our children is to attract and retain quality teachers. So we're not going to cut that back. Uh, There are other areas, though, that are more responsive to the individual ups and downs of uh, of uh, state funding, and I think that those are some areas where people feel that you know we ought to be sure that we're funding the state adequately uh, as we continue to look for ways to cut taxes. All those thoughts. Uh, we've got more coming up with State Representative Stephen Hartkin, uh, and we'll take more of your telephone calls following the break as well. So be patient. You see the phone flashing. Uh, I, I do have that over in the periphery here. Uh, that's on the way in a few minutes. We're at nine forty. And we're at 68. Bill Colley is well on top story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio 1310.com. We wanted to mention State Representative Steve Hartkin is uh, joining us, Stephen or Steve, if you will, but joining us in studio until 10 o'clock this morning. And we're at 68. Bill Colley with you as well on top story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio 1310.com. The representative also available to take your telephone calls. And uh, your questions and comments at 736-0300. Uh, just a quick note, I wanted to mention our friends at Mount Harrison Audiology and Rupert. Uh, they've got a contest going on. They'd like you to get out and experience summer in Idaho. Uh, in fact, they're suggesting, calling it a scavenger hunt, I guess, is what they're doing. Drop by the offices in Rupert and you can pick up a contest card. Visit at least one county fair, one fine arts theater event, one outdoor event, and one place of beauty. Not difficult to find in Idaho. Turn in your card along with proof of attendance a photograph, a ticket stub, or a program for a chance to win. The grand prize is $500 off either a medium or high-end set of hearing aids. Lots of other prizes, too. You can pick up the card at Mount Harrison Audiology behind Minidoka Memorial Hospital, Suite 2, the number 208-312-0957. Also, check them out online at mountharrisonaudiology.com. The representative and I were having a, a conversation off air Uh, about if the court rules in favor of the lawsuit by these 30 legislators and then strikes down the governor's veto by saying it was too late, that actually is going to take more power away. Well, the governor's already seen that happen because of the constitutional change um, and with regulations and uh, review by the legislature. At some point, you know, everyone wants to be governor now, at least for Republicans, but in the future we, we start taking more and more power from that office, you may not have anywhere near as many people interested in the job. Well, that was one of the arguments that the governor's office used in their in their uh, court brief filings 
was that if the legislature is allowed to do this, then effectively it removes the power of the veto and takes it away from the governor. Uh, because essentially what that would do is to say that there is no limit and that the legislature contains the power and the governor's veto cannot be used. And uh, so I think the court's going to be reluctant to go quite that far, but they may very well look at this as a way of saying, hey, you have to, the word adjournment means adjournment. It doesn't mean two days after adjournment. So you have 10 days following adjournment to either veto or not veto a legislation. And if you wait beyond that 10-day period, then it becomes law. Uh, Idaho does not have a pocket veto process like some states do that allows the governor just to hold the bill mm -hmm. and kill it by holding it. They have to take action in Idaho. And that argument is, for people who may be tuning in, did he do it from the time he receives it on his desk, or does it actually go, it was settled once, what, 1978, or does it, it start from the time the legislature actually sends it? And so there's a two-day, an argument over 48 hours is what this is about. Right. It, but the real, the real difference here is what is the meaning of the word adjournment? Does it mean at the time when the legislature says we're done, or does it mean two days later when the governor receives that last bill? Uh, so that's really the issue uh, that will be decided here. And <clears throat> while the court may be reluctant to overturn the 1970s case uh, that they are relying on, they're going to look at that and say, does that really conform with the, the clear language of the Constitution? I uh, I had a question I told you before we got started today that I wanted to bring this up. There was a survey done, was released, I think, early this week, that, uh, and I don't know what the publication was, it's not in front of me, but my coworkers were buzzing about it yesterday that said Idaho was the most boring state in the Union. Montana finished second. They threw Utah in the top ten. Um I think people who live here would take a, take issue with that. Uh, they might not only take issue with it, but they might be pleased with it because it it tells <laughs> other people don't come here. We're we're doing fine just as we are. We don't need those outside influences from wherever they may be. It's okay sometimes to be a little bit boring. Most boring, probably not. Probably we shouldn't be most boring state in the country. Uh, I've never thought of us that way. I, people who visited here when I took the job, I had a friend. Uh, and he was telling me he used to come here to White River Raft. And he said, you're going to maybe the most beautiful place in the United States. And I was telling you off air, in fact, his brother is a professor at Quinnipiac in Connecticut. And when I told him stories about the governor doing these these town hall sessions, these capital for a day sessions, where he spends an entire day answering all questions from all comers, uh, he, he wrote me back and he said, can we clone your governor? Uh, and when I tell people what I pay for my gas and my electricity, and that's gas to eat the home, uh, when I tell them that, they're stunned. When I tell them what we pay for groceries, they're stunned. When uh, Just telling them basics about tax return I get from the state. What I, when I lived in New York, I remember I worked there one year for eight months and then four months in Delaware. I got a refund from Delaware, but I paid New York. When I came here, that tax burden, state tax burden, is even less. My car insurance was $83 a month on one car in New York. It was 73 in Delaware. It was at one time like 33 here. I've got two vehicles now, and I'm paying what I did for one in New York. So all of these things, when you call it boring, yet you can put a little bit more money away, seems to me uh, boring is not a bad thing. I think that's a good point, Bill. It's uh, you know We're a state that is conservative in terms of fiscal responsibility. We balance our budget every year. If we have a little surplus, we set it aside in the rainy day fund, or we put it back into, in this case, roads and some other things, uh, or we try to give it back to the people, which is what uh, this issue is really all about, the tax issue. I also like to point out that we have not only some of the lowest electric rates in the nation, but we also have relatively low cost of living generally. If you look at, say, Twin Falls, we're about 20% below the national average of cost of living if you take housing, food, gas, transportation. Commute time, well, there are 3,500 counties in the United States. The average commute time in Twin Falls County is 14 minutes from home to work, okay? That's the, that's the average in this county. We're the 10th best county in the country on commute time. So we should count our blessings. We're not spending hours in traffic uh, uh, on the way to uh, an office in downtown Washington or wherever.
People that I, I talk to, though, confuse us with Iowa. That's how little known Idaho still is. And I'll have to tell them, no, Des Moines and Boise are both very nice places, but different parts of the country. Uh, and yet we're seeing this population boom. Most of those people, though, coming here are retirees looking for those low-cost benefits. Yet there was a story, I think just yesterday, that said we have a nursing shortage. So you're going to have older people here, fewer people caring for them. That's the one thing we need to solve. Well, we certainly have some issues in terms of the nature of our workforce. A lot of our young people do leave, and they and they sometimes come back. Uh, a little bit later in life or when they are retired, partly for the economic benefit, but partly for the cultural benefit. It's a small, clean city. You drive into this city from, say, Jackpot, Nevada, and you come over that ridge, and you come down into this beautiful farmland uh, here in the middle of the Intermountain West with a nice small uh, city in the middle of it, and you say, God, how did I miss this? How did I not know this was here when I was on the way to Yellowstone? I think I'll drive around, take a look around, maybe stop by the visitor center, grab a real estate brochure or two. Uh, and pretty soon, you know, they go back to their home in California or Washington or, and say, you know, you know, Sally, maybe we ought to look at uh, a move uh, and think about that. Two of the people I met here, we talked about Internet earlier. When I first moved here and I had it installed in my first place and then I moved to a second, had it installed again in both cases the installers were transplants from California. They came here because they realized this was a better place to raise their kids than living in one of the metropolises there. I think that's probably true. I think whenever I've done, you know, sort of informal surveys, uh, it's the quality of life. And sometimes there's some code language to that, crime-related, congestion, uh, taxes, over-governmental regulation. Uh, sometimes it's schools, sometimes it's other factors, but they all come down to quality of life. And people look at this and they're smart enough to see that if they can make it here and there's opportunity, uh, then, they, then, they'll, then they'll take a look at, at making, the, making the change. This area, I moved here in the early 1980s, and I can tell you that the growth in this area has been nothing short of, of fantastic. This area has been wonderful to me, both professionally and personally. And I would encourage anybody who's listening to call your call your cousin in Tennessee or wherever they may be living, and just say, "Have you ever thought about moving west?" You know, there's some real there's some real pluses to that. You you in fact during the break we were talking about the fact that there's that conservative to libertarian sort of lifestyle here, that people come here and they find they don't have a lot of interference. They can just pretty much live their lives without a lot of that. Someone looking over their shoulder. I think that's true. We have a relatively limited government. There are those who think it ought to be a lot more limited. But really, if you look at the total picture of the, of the state and the communities in the state, it's a very freedom-oriented environment. We have a freedom caucus in the Idaho legislature. It's called the Republican Party. Uh, and we don't need a, quote, separate freedom caucus because we are the freedom caucus. We've enacted this legislation over the years and limited legislation over the years that allows people to live as they want to live and to have the responsibility and the benefits uh, from it. We have a well, just a quick time check. It's 9.53. Our guest is State Representative Stephen Hartkin, and we're already at 70. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Speaking of those different divisions, people say, well, we've got this caucus and that caucus. You've got Labrador and Fulcher who are fighting, everyone says, for a particular side of the Republican vote. Tommy Alquist is a lot more like Brad Little, I think, in the sense that, you know, he's, he's sort of a business guy. But in reality, you look at all four of them, no matter who, and the Democrat is probably not going to be a factor running in this race in 2018, if there is one. But all four of them, no matter who ends up out of those four as governor, you, there's not going to be any radical change in the way the state operates. Uh I think that's probably true. Uh, there are some differences amongst the four of them, and some of them are differences amongst even the two of them. For example, Labrador and Fulcher uh, are more conservative probably than Alquist and Little. So if you're going to vote for either Alquist or Little, uh, you're probably picking a more pragmatic, uh, common-sense approach to governance and funding what we need. Fulcher and Labrador have more of a slash-and-burn 
philosophy and are likely to try to implement that. Now, whether that'll happen or not uh, in the legislature is another matter. And, and but, but all four would likely end up being very friendly to businesses Absolutely. in the sense that however they would govern, business would flourish. I think that's true. We have a very good business structure. Uh, we have some nice, uh, some nice uh, things that help businesses get started. So I think we're in pretty good shape. We should count our blessings. We have time to take one last caller. We're at 9.55. And caller, you're up next. You're on the air on KLIX. Go ahead. Actually, I was trying to get a hold of Sean Hannity. <laughs> well, give it a few more hours. Uh, Sean Hannity will be along just after 1 o'clock news today. It's 9.56. We should point out, too, that there is some concern that this population growth, uh, Steve Millington told me that come 2022, Canyon and Ada counties alone, because of the population growth there, could be and, uh, electing all future statewide officials in in Idaho. And, and if they become a little bit more liberal, though, it breaks that growing Republican hold on the state. Well, that's true, but I don't think they're becoming more liberal. Uh, uh, Canyon County certainly is not. Uh, Ada County, yes, there's some particularly in the center of Boise and so forth. But generally, those are still pretty conservative uh, Republican-dominated uh, districts. And yes, they may have more population at the next census, and that would increase their power relative to smaller communities like twin or rural areas like Lincoln County or whatever. But those are natural occurrences that occur in every state with each census configuration. That's why we have the, the consensus, the census that we have, and our founding fathers uh, directed that we have that annual census and that apportionment be based on that, on the numbers. Randy Staples says it's possible we may see that whole metropolitan area around the Capitol get a third congressional district, uh, that it's likely we're not that far away from it. That's probably correct. We're going to be at about 1.9 million population uh, at the end of this decade, and uh, with more growth, that's probably going to be enough to push us up to a third congressional seat. And uh, yet it won't really have any impact statewide on seats. They'll just expand the number of people you represent. I think it would expand the number of people we represent. Each district now is about 45,000. So if you take uh, two, 2 million people and divide that by the number of legislative districts, 35, you're going to come up with about 65,000 rather than 45,000. No, we've got to wrap up. But for people who are tuning in this morning, if they have legislative questions, even though there's no activity going on as far as session. Uh, how do they go about getting a hold sure, of you? I'm in the phone book. I'm easy to get a hold of. Just look me up in the phone book or call me or email me. I'm easy to find, and I'll be glad to talk with anyone. Thank you for having me. Yeah, sure, and we've got to do it again sometime soon. Thank you. As I said, we're going to start making this more of a regular uh, regular uh, uh, feature of the program. We're at 9.59. We've got to take a short break, and news is along coming up next. From Fox, Rush Limbaugh's program on the way after Fox News at 10 o'clock. And God willing, in the creek don't rise, <coughs> I get to come back and do this all over again tomorrow morning. Also, got a short visit from Kelton Hatch tomorrow. He's going to be talking about the statewide free fishing days coming up Saturday.